Our leader today is, is Clark Floyd, and he will refresh us, refresh everyone about the, uh, uh, the material that we're covering for today. So we're about, uh, uh, or approaching two thirds of the way through the, the novel. Um, and we have two more sessions, I think, uh, scheduled after this month. So I'm going to turn things over now to Clark, Clark Cloyd from Atlanta, who is the discussion leader for today. And um, Clark, I think you you have some PowerPoint material to present, and you've you've uh, uh, a little a little bit and. Ava is ready to, to yes. show that. So, okay, Clark, I'll turn things over to you and, and let you proceed and remind us about which sections of the novel we are discussing today. Okay, thank you, John. Um, hey, I'm Clark Cloyd. That's a tongue twister. Uh, for you poetry nerds out there, it's actually an example of Kim Ghanid, a uh, double consonants repeated uh, alliteratively. Um, <laughs> My parents didn't know that, but I found it out in grad school. Um, so I'm a high school English teacher. Um, this is my 40th year, uh, which means I'm a generalist. I'm not, you know, the authority. Uh, I, I teach everything from Homer to, to contemporary novels. Tomorrow I'll be teaching uh, Act 3, Scene 2 and 3 of Macbeth and Chapter 6 of The Grapes of Rats. So uh, today I feel I'm kind of like on a busman's holiday, right? I never leave school. <laughs> um, so uh, Ava, can you put up the slide of the chapter summaries that I concocted, please? Uh, so here are the, the chapters. Uh, I number them from book two. So this would be 31 through 38. Um, so we begin at the theater uh, and then we're waiting for Estella. So how to kill time, let's go to prison. Um, and then we're at the end with Estella. Um, Pip then takes us into uh, a little financial information about his life, quite a spendthrift. Um, uh, Mrs. Jaro Gardry dies. And so uh, we have to go to the funeral. Um, in the next chapter, Pip's com Pip comes of age, which means money, among other things. Uh, the chapter following, he visits Wimmick at Little Britain where we find out that Wimmick is a mechanical engineer, apparently. Uh, he's very good with little uh, creations in his his castle. Um, and then finally, the, the big finish for this section is uh, Estella. Um, so that's kind of the overview. It's framed, I think, by some fairly significant chapters. Uh, along the way, too, what I've noted is Dickens does a fantastic job of mixing up seriousness and comedy. He never lets us get too far away from a good laugh uh, while also taking us on Pip's journey. Um, so I, there's there's so much here. I, I, reading this, preparing for this day was overwhelming for me because every chapter is just chock full of fantastic information. Um, so I, I did try to pull out just a few broad topics perhaps that I'd like to I would like to hit on and then I'm of course interested in what other folks have discovered or worried about or pondered um so Ava could you put the next slide the topics so I was thinking about this uh, I want to talk about the the night in Denmark uh, the production of Hamlet um and of course got to talk about expectations because that's what we're all about here with Pip how that's proceeding, um, particularly interested in thinking about where he's getting advice, how he takes that in, what that means for him. Um, and since we begin with Hamlet, there are a lot of ghosts in this section, uh, specters of all sorts. And um, so it's kind of in a way framed by those ghosts, uh, whether it's um, Hamlet's father, comically in the stage, and then with Miss Havisham uh, at the end, who is incredibly spooky and ghost-like. And then finally, you know, Stella! 
<laughs> I, mean, it's, I can only think of Marlon Brando yelling out her, that name. Um, so with that in mind, I, I was going to suggest that we kind of dig in with that first chapter about the night at the theater and particularly why Hamlet? Um, we, Dickens was fond of Shakespeare uh, in the essay Night Walks. Uh, he calls Shakespeare um, uh, the great master who knew everything. Uh, so given that he could have selected any number of Shakespearean plays to allude to here. I'm just curious, why Hamlet? And we can take down those topics now, Ava, I think. Maybe uh, because Hamlet uh, is dealing with uh, understanding himself and the characters in this play try to understand. Peep and Stella in particular, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Talk about a troubled <laughs> self-understanding. Uh, Hamlet's yeah. your man. I had a wonderful student write a paper about Hamlet once that said that what he is doing is searching for a role model uh, that, you know, he has the ghost of his father who tells him what to do, and then he has... Um, all these other role models in the play and he comes to realize that he's not any of those so using that as a kind of a a thought it certainly fits with the pip's journey i have i have i had some uh i had a different uh uh reaction to it i hadn't i i could not uh I could not associate Hamlet with Pip, although you know you could do that in sort of sort of sort some sort of vague way. But there's no actual and no Pip. Pip isn't really all that present in the chapter. I think uh, it seemed to me like uh, Dickens was making fun of the audience, like bad actors and even worse audiences who don't understand the conventions of the play. And they're constantly interrupting <laughs> and shouting. It's like they're more they're more like at a you know they're at a carnival or something like that rather than a theater play. They have no understanding what what Shakespeare is. So it's kind of like Dickens making fun of himself almost. To say, you know, Dickens the author saying, "And by the way, I'm writing you this thing. You you morons who probably don't understand what I'm talking about anyway. You know, and I don't know. That's it was kind of like I was amused at at." Uh, at all the all, at the audience, the absolute refusal of the audience to realize that they're in a Shakespeare play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, it's fantastic comedy. It is just a brilliant send up of that amateur performance. I, I guess we've all seen that at some point, <laughs> David. I'm not sure it's an amateur performance. One of the things you could do if you were an aspiring actor was rent a theater and its company hmm. and people would do that there's a, a music hall song which is a little later the night i appeared as macbeth you could probably find it on youtube when somebody in the audience heckling says shakespeare's dead and the actor says Poor old Bill, I never knew the poor blighter was ill. But uh, you have all these possibilities uh, for if you're an amateur aspiring to act. Uh, McGonagall appeared as Macbeth. Mag William McGonagall was uh, a contender for the world's worst poet who was a weaver in Scotland, you can find his poetry online. He asked his minister for a blurb, and the minister said, Shakespeare never wrote anything like this, which is an awfully good, ambiguous recommendation. Uh, another thing that happened with some of the smaller theater companies was that 
they would feature a night where a star from London would mm -hmm. come down and play the role if, uh, say, you hired Sir Henry Irving, he would send his stage manager, who was Bram Stoker, to rehearse the company. And Stoker would say to Claudius, okay, after the first sentence in this speech, cut to the last one, and you stand there and listen. And... Uh, the great man would come and do a performance which was about as short as you could get. <laughs> uh, dramatic quality somewhat missing if you cut all the other actors to parts to ribbons. But uh, all this stuff went on. So I don't think this is an amateur performance I think it's maybe semi-pro, but what do you say, John? I think I think to call it a semi-pro, semi-professional uh, performance is is accurate um, because this is it, it's a theater, it's a theater company. They have uh, a dresser uh, who's more concerned about the costume. <laughs> Uh, than he was about any other aspect of the performance. Um, there's an audience that apparently has paid to attend, so it, it has sort of the the larger structure of a of a professional performance. But uh, who has organized this? Who is responsible for this performance taking place? Um, uh, and, and that's the if if you will amateur slightly amateur uh, aspect of of the performance so i think you're you're on to something there david um, but shouldn't the ghost at least know his lines <laughs> <laughs> there on. aren't that many <laughs> there's a lovely uh british book the art of course acting the author defines a course actor as somebody who knows his lines, but not necessarily the order in which they come. <laughs> Sounds like Huck Finn. Lena. Yeah, I wanted, speaking of Huck Finn, I wanted to uh, mention a wonderful book about Shakespeare in the US uh, by the late Lawrence Levine, a professor of history at Berkeley. It's called Highbrow, Lowbrow. And he argues that in the course of the 19th century, uh, Shakespeare was sacralized in this country. Uh, in, but before that process took place, there was a lot of audience participation. And I think he has one anecdote about Richard III being performed someplace, you know, maybe in the in the raw Western community. And um, at one point, an audience member yells, I'll see you after the performance to the actor who's playing Richard III, um, you know, in other words, he's, he's really thinks this guy is a villain in real life. And of course, there's the famous Huck Finn send up. But audiences were a lot more rowdy, I take it, at least in this country, and probably in, in the UK, in, in Britain as well, is my surmise. Everyone's a critic, right? So <laughs> why not have the spontaneous reaction? Um, you couldn't I, manage a real blackout in the theater at that point. My freshman year in college, I had a very good teacher in a course who assigned as one possible paper topic comparing Mr. Wopsle's Hamlet with the King and the Duke's Shakespeare a travesty, yeah. Huck Finn. That was fun to do. Of course, the difference is the Duke and the uh, Dolphin, as he's called, are, are out to take money from people. They're you know, out to get the rubes. And here, I feel like this is such a sincere production. <laughs> and, uh, maybe not quite satisfying. Actually, um, Catherine and I went to see a, a, a play of A Tale of Two Cities last night here in Atlanta. Uh, 
playing a little fast and loose with the story, but part of the play was uh, audience participation. That uh, they had a kind of, I don't know, Greek chorus kind of figure on stage and would elicit responses from the audience at certain points. You know, please boo, hiss, be exultant. Uh, so that was kind of fun, actually. It's nice not to just sit in the seat and watch. Um, oh. Yeah, I could think about with Hamlet was it's a, reve a revenge tragedy. Um, and by the end of this night's uh, this uh, class's reading, we have we have a very clear discussion of what vengeance has meant for Estella. And I just wondered if that's something that uh, Dickens might have had in mind as part of this story. Um, I was going to say I go to Shakespeare Los Angeles, or when I did before I moved to Oregon, and uh, and uh, in the comic in Shakespeare comedy. Uh, the Los Angeles company always engages audience participation. Mm -hmm. It's like you know breaking down the barrier between the you know the the sort of the the the, the stage and the uh, the audience is just that's part of the comedy, and uh, and uh, violating those conventions. Dickens doing that isn't much different than than like the Los Angeles Shakespeare Company, you know inviting the audience to participate in the comedy, you know, so, uh, except in this, <laughs> and yeah, it's just, uh, it's just a bunch of fun. It's a fun, it's fun, you know. One of the other things to remember about this, this chapter and this performance is that the audience is an audience used to going to popular theater and particularly to melodrama mm. and in Victorian melodrama, it's common to boo the villain when the villain comes on stage or to applaud the hero or to comment on the production. And uh, so so Dickens is 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 having fun with that that part of reality. Um, but I don't think that it's entirely uh, parodic. It's not it's not it's not entirely a parody of what's going on it's 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 partly realistic but it also is hamlet and it's shakespeare and dickens admires shakespeare and so there's a serious dimension to the choice of subject at the right. same time that it is a comedy directed at um at Wopsle in particular. And and so we probably need to say a few things about who Wopsle is and Wopsle's what we know about Wopsle and um, how Wopsle comes to be the the have the lead role in this in this production, um, but Catherine, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that the connection with Pip and Hamlet. Um, someone said earlier about how he's struggling to figure out who he is, and the one part of the one of the things that Dickens slash Pip talk, says specifically about the play is where he says, for example, in the question of whether it was nobler in the mind to suffer, some roared yes and some no, and some inclining to both opinions said toss up for it, and quite a debating society arose, which is hilarious, right? But it's also like that's kind of like Pip is sort of trying to figure out if he should be suffering or he should be like you know, not suffering and, you know, yes, no, or maybe we should just toss up for it. <laughs> uh, and at the end of the chapter, gets quite serious. Pip is significantly affected by this play. He has a nightmare based on Hamlet. Uh, miserably, I went to bed after all and miserably thought of Estella and miserably dreamed that my expectations were all canceled and I had to give my hand in marriage to Herbert, Herbert's Clara or play Hamlet to Miss Havisham's ghost before 20,000 people without knowing 20 words of it. That's a horrifying nightmare to me. <laughs> so so do you think, I, I was thinking about it, why was did he feel so bad at the end? And I thought that he felt bad because the way they, they treated Wapso, they weren't honest with him. And he, it's always like Herbert starts by being not honest and saying good things and the uh, people following him. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe that's what, I wasn't sure what bothered him, what, why he felt so bad at the end. 
He says, I was so sorry for him as it was. For Hamlet? No, for uh, for Wopsle. For Watson, yeah, 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 yeah. That's nice name. Thoughts? <laughs> David? I can't resist an audience reaction story. Uh, Max Beerbohm's half-brother, Sir Herbert Beerbohm Tree, played Hamlet. And in the audience was Oscar Wilde, who came back to the dressing room afterwards. And he talked about this, and he talked about that, and he never mentioned the play. And finally, Tree couldn't stand it anymore. What did you think of my performance? Wilde said, oh, very nice, very nice, my dear fellow. Funny without being vulgar. If you were an actor, that would keep you awake at night. Uh. One of the parts of the scene that, that I have <laughs> appreciated and kept in mind um, for use in situations when I was asked to make a compliment and was a little bit reluctant to make the compliment is the the comment that that Herbert gives to Pip to, uh, to, to you know what did you think of the performance and Wopsle of course wants praise of his performance and so the prompt that Herbert gives to Pip and that Pip repeats is massive and concrete um, <laughs> And what on earth does massive and concrete really mean? <laughs> um, it, it sounds like a wonderful thing to say that your performance was massive and concrete, but it says absolutely nothing uh, about the, the actual quality of the performance. So um, it's, it, you know, when I ask for an opinion uh, <laughs> and I, I, I'm reluctant to Get, provide the praise that is being requested, I, I sometimes say, oh, it, it was massive and concrete. My my mother used to say that went over like a ton of bricks. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Pip loves it too. He takes it as his own, um, as if I had originated it. That's fantastic. Yes, yes. So, Ava, you have a a comment. Um, I actually just want to point out someone's comment in the chat. Uh, yep. Cynthia Poindexter says, what are we to make of Pip's dream at the end of the chapter that he has to play Hamlet to Miss Havisham's ghost? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Good question. Barbara. Well, the, the kind of obvious thing is that um, she's trying to set up her little puppets, manipulate them, tell them what to do. And uh, certainly Hamlet's father is trying to do that as well in a very... Um, it's, it's a... Re revenge for him too isn't it i mean he wants to get back at his enemies through hamlet or hopes he can and behind this fantasy and this this dream that that pip has is his conviction that his benefactor is miss havisham yeah so, uh the the dream is at least in part a, a response to uh, Pip's wish or an expression of Pip's wish to obey the commands of his benefactor. So he has to play Hamlet to Miss Havisham's ghost, who is giving him instructions about what he should do. Bill? Yeah, I was just thinking that that's interesting, that I normally think of Miss Hamisham as being the person opposed to Pip, but from Pip's standpoint, she's the person driving, you know, who, who's pushing him forward in the world. So him thinking of 
her being the the carrying the ghostly part being the the originator of the revenge makes sense to him even if it doesn't make sense to us because we know that's not really what's happening um i also found the the comment about um dreading you know performing hamlet in front of twenty thousand people and not knowing 20 lines um yeah. that uh you know the end of hamlet is a bit harrowing everybody dies they have to bring on extras to carry the bodies off but no what he was worried about is oh the actual act of performing and not knowing what you're doing in front of all of those people that's what gave him nightmares yeah and which i can sympathize with and it, doesn't Hamlet have the most number of lines in Shakespeare? Yes. Is that true? That actor or that role, yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, I was, uh, well, actually, Pip is leading, li li leading a dream or, you know, his, his beliefs that somehow or another all, uh, everything is faded, you know, somehow or another. It's like he believes it's actually it's fated to come out as he wants. For example, later in the later in the section that we read, he starts talking about how you know Elsa Estelle is torturing him, and that uh, uh, he, but he's putting up with it because she's also torturing all the other men, and he figures that that's part of Miss Havisham's plan to 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 have Estella torture all the other men, and then finally he will get Estella. Because all the other men there will be eliminated, and it will be only Pip. And at the moment that all the other men in the world are tortured uh, by Estella, then Pip will come into his own, and he will get Estella. Because that's Miss Havisham's part of Miss Havisham's plan. So there's a there's a whole delusional uh, quality to Pip's expectations of what's going to happen with him and Estella, you know. And none of that is true. It's all it's all his, it's all it's all his fabrication based on you know, presumption, you know. So he's created his own nightmare too, <laughs> in a sense. Why is Wopsle the, the character who is the comedic center of this of this chapter? What do we remember about Wopsle that Helps us understand his his role. When do we first meet Wopsle? Hmm. Is, is it when they come to Pip's home, to Joe's home? Uh, they have a kind of a party there. Hmm. No. It it's very early in the in the novel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a isn't it when he's reading the news about the capture of the criminals? Yeah. Wasn't he invited to dinner that night? Yes. What is Wopsle's role in the village? He was a clerk of the church. Yes. Oh, yeah. And what does he do in the church? David, you have your hand up. He reads the lesson and shows off his actor's voice and thinks how much better he would be as the parson than the incumbent is. But I think the reason that he's coming to the fore here is he went out with Pip and Joe and the soldiers when they were hunting for the convict. And we're being reminded of that. Okay. He's in a position to recognize other participants from that episode. Okay, there, there are many times in, in this section when we're reminded of things that happened at the very beginning of the of the book, um, hey, um, Wopsle, Wopsle is is one of those, and I I I think that Wopsle is a kind of comic version of Pip. Um, he's hmm. someone whose who, whose life in the village 
is to be the reader of the lesson in the church. And he aspires, he, he thinks he's a better performer in mm. the church context than the preacher is. Mm. And he's like Pip, he's someone who goes from the village to the city in order to realize his great expectations. Mm -hmm. His expectations that he is really cut out to be not just the secondary reader in a small village church, but to be the performer of Hamlet on a yeah. London stage. Yeah, he has he has ambitions, but but uh, but there's nobody there to help him. Yeah. You know? <laughs> of course, he's so totally helpless himself. So you can that's the, the, which is so, the, why it's so comic. Yeah. He can't he can't he can't he can't even help himself to do it. Just, uh, anyway. I was just looking back at page twenty five. Uh, Mr. Wopsel said grace with theatrical declamation. As it now appears to me, something like a religious cross of the ghost in Hamlet and Richard the Third, and ended with the very proper aspiration that we might be truly grateful. <laughs> uh, so the Hamlet connection is there from from the start, from the very start. It's crazy. And and we also need to remember, I think that uh, don't we all. I grew up in a small town. Don't we all know somebody that's kind of like that? <laughs> <laughs> Has these lofty expectations, but uh, really no skill set for it. <laughs> and prayers that would never end. Yes, and prayers that would never end. <laughs> Pat. So, Pat, you're muted. Yes, I just I just did that. So, uh, will we see? Uh, for those of you, I read this book a long, long time ago. For those of you who are more presently familiar, will we see Wopsle come back again after this fiasco? Because I'm trying to figure out what is Dickens trying to achieve with uh, Wopsle reappearing at this particular time. Hmm. It's just comedy. It's just a comedic kind of thing. Well, and as John also pointed out, we have all these interweavings. Dickens has got to make certain we don't forget that this thing happened at the beginning of the book that it, it is not over with, right? And he has all these devices to make certain that we don't forget. Okay, so that's that's the only reason that he's there is to remind us that he was part of the village. I also remember that when Joe came to visit first time, mm -hmm. one of the reasons is to bring a ticket to the theater. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Wops well, would recur uh, in one of the most effective scenes, I think. Say no more. Say more, David. I don't want to get into uh, what's going to... on in the next ah, time yeah. we see Wopsle, but this is establishing him in our memory so that mm. Uh, there's a, a really uh, frightening, that's not quite the word, scene involving Wopsel that is still to come. Okay. That, that's that's enough. We we will <laughs> see more of, of Wopsel. Right. <laughs> um. Yeah, I, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, somebody just said that the reason that, you know, one of the reasons Joe came to London to visit Pip was to see Wopsle or company Wopsle or whatever. And that was, I feel like Joe was like showing his support of a fellow village person. And I think Pip kind of has that same opportunity here to support Wopsle. Like at the end, he doesn't have to rush out to see him and invite him out to dinner, but he does which yeah. I think shows a, a kind of, I don't know, like a, a generosity and maturity that 
was really nice to see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, shall we move on? Yes. We yeah. Walk behind for now. Um, <laughs> um, I do think it, it maybe just indulge me for a second. Uh, I do think the next chapter in the visit to Newgate Prison is interesting uh, because it, it's it's not pleasant for Pat. <laughs> it's it's a uh, uh, very uncomfortable, and I just think it's interesting because I I just taught uh, last month a tale of two cities uh, where prisons figure prominently. Uh, and then uh, an essay called Night Walks, uh, in which Dickens wanders around London over several nights and then conflates the whole experience into a single journey around London. And one of his stops is at Newgate Prison uh, on that journey. And yeah. if you can indulge me, I have a slide of his description of Newgate, Newgate Prison from um, Night Walks. Uh, Ava, could you pull that up? Yeah. Yes, I will pull that up now. Um, uh, the prison. There's a there, there's an image of the Newgate prison from the exterior. Um, it's an imposing edifice. Um, let's move on to the passage if we can. Um, uh, where is that? I think it might be oh, the passage. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, uh, there's executions for fun. Um, so Dickens' narrator himself is wandering around London, and he has uh, stopped prior to this moment at uh, the empty theater, and he has imagined uh, uh, his presence in this building, and it gets fairly gloomy, and um, he starts to imagine graveyards and corpse candles, and he moves on from the empty theater uh, to the next paragraph. In those small hours when there was no movement in the streets, it afforded matter for reflection to take Newgate in the way, and touching its rough stone to think of the prisoners in their sleep, and then to glance in at the lodge over the spiked wicket and see the fire and light of the watching turnkeys on the white wall. Not an inappropriate time either to linger by that wicked little debtor's door, shutting tighter than any other door one ever saw, which has been death's door to so many. In the days of the uttering of forged one-pound notes by people tempted up from the country, how many hundreds of wretched creatures of both sexes, many quite innocent, swung out of a pitiless and inconsistent world at the tower of yonder church, Christian church of St. Sepulchre, monstrously before their eyes. Is there any haunting of the bank parlor by the remorseful souls of old directors in the nights of these later days, I wonder, or is it as quiet as this degenerate Al-Sadama of an old Bailey? So having just taught this essay, and then uh, having before that just taught A Tale of Two Cities, and then to read this section, I, and they're all taking place right between 1859 and 1860. It seems to me interesting that uh, Dickens has prisons on the brain here uh, and takes time out in this novel to give us a little glimpse into that grim world uh, and the effect that it has on Pip, um, especially to see Herbert handling himself so well in such a in such a uh, upsetting situation. Um, any thoughts about what Pip might be gaining from this adventure while he's trying to kill time until Estella gets there? Right. Well, why did you mention Herbert? Sorry. I mean, excuse me, uh, Wemmick. Excuse me. Wemmick, Wemmick. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay, Sorry. okay. Bill? Yeah, but I think this uh, a lot of ways go back goes back to you know Dickens' childhood and you know I I think he only spent a limited or his family only spent a limited amount of time in debtor's prison and yet it does seem to reoccur in several of his novels and it's a you know a, a very common motif for him and you know I guess the analysis that I've seen and people have commented that this was very formative to his life um, his worldview is sort you know in looking at his books 
this is the prison is always something looming behind that you know all you have to do is do one thing wrong and you might end up in prison because you know that's essentially what happened to him and his family so it was uh, just finished david copperfield a couple of weeks ago and the, there's the same the same things going on there where you know his uh, his good friends are in and out of debtor's prison or being threatened with it all the time david Didn't mean to have my hand up, but uh, hmm. one thing about this visit to Nougat is once again, Pip is ignoring the constant recurrence of the sordid criminal world in his life and thinking, oh, that's that's all irrelevant. That doesn't have anything to do with me. He's refusing to accept uh, the omens that are there for him. What are some of the other omens from earlier in the book that are reminders of Pip's connection with criminality. Um, in, in what sense is Pip a criminal? In the, in the way he stole stuff to give it to the, to the guy who escaped, yeah. Lied to his family, yeah. Yes, those are those are good reminders. Yeah. What other reminders has the novel? The novel is constantly offering up uh, moments, experiences that suggest the criminal world that Pip is not noticing, or if he does notice, he says, "That's that's not me. I'm I'm." I have expectations of becoming a gentleman. I have no connection with criminals. Yeah. But we keep getting him involved with criminals through Jaeger and uh, any time with Jamer and Wemmick. Uh, he's constantly having to go there to get his money. Yes. And that, uh, that's where the criminals are going. And the, and the people hanging around are people often who are uh, accused of crimes and are up in court and that's why they're outside Jaeger's offices plus you've got the the masks of the two criminals who were executed in the in the office that are frequently <laughs> referred to so that we're constantly having this theme pushed in front of us and we also have the scene of the two convicts that were in the uh, coach uh, talking about giving the one have being instructed to give Pip the money, right? Uh huh. Uh huh. And there's, I mean, that it, you know is another part of that theme. What kind of money is this? You know. Glenna. Yeah, I wanted to point out. We there's a kind of gruesome thing about Molly. Uh, Jagger's yeah. woman servant and what she might or might not have been guilty of. And when he's in Newgate, I thought one of the most striking passages, he meets the guy who's about to be executed. And what struck me was he, the omniscient narrator gives a description, i.e. Dickens gives a description of this man whom we meet fleetingly and we'll never encounter again, but it's such a beautiful, we learn what he's wearing. I think it's a green coat. I mean, it's this incredibly perfect paragraph of a description of a doomed man. But um, yeah, there's a lot of intimations of criminality along the way. Sarah? So, so uh, I say a uh, pip pays a lot of attention to what happens there 
and especially he, he learns about how um, Wormick uh, 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 performs there and how juggers work as opposed to, and, and it's not, it shows us that he paid so much uh, uh, attention because in his mind, he has a metaphor of a, a garden. Mm -hmm. So he's treating the people like a garden and the person who is about to get executed is already the dead plant and his mind already thinks how he'll replace it with a new plant. So I, I wondered at the end of the chapter when he sees Stella, uh, he says there was a nameless shadow which again in that one instant had passed and I was wondering what is a shadow and I was thinking it might be related to the jail, yeah. You beat me to that passage. Nice. That sentence that you pointed out is, is fantastic on page 262. With that, he looked back and nodded at this dead plant and then cast his eyes about him and, wake, and walking out of the yard as if he were considering what other pot would go best in its place. Yeah. Fantastic yeah. metaphor. Yeah. Peter? Um, yeah, I'm always I'm always struck about uh, whenever Dickens has to deal with money uh, and the idea of inheritance. There's a, a becoming a gentleman seems to you know in a lot of Dickens novels seems to have to do with being given money, but not necessarily doing anything. Like uh, Joe is Joe works for his money, and I remember in this section, uh, even uh, Wemmick was you know Wemmick who's in the law business originally started out being a cooper. He was going to be a cooper and his father works in a warehouse. Uh, and, you know, there's something as Dickens associates with, you know, you need to work for a living and that gentlemen actually don't work for a living. That, that people go around stealing money in Dickens novels like Mr. Myrtle in Little Dorrit. He just goes and grabs people's money by by you know by fraud. You know he's the cyber he's a cyber uh, uh, coin uh, operator of this period. You know and uh, so there's something very dubious about wanting to become a gentleman in the sense that you expect people to give you money without you having to work for it. So there's some sort of vague taint associated with the idea of being a gentleman that. In the background, well, how did they get their money? You know, it's like there's a suspicion of like just unwarranted or unmerited wealth. Like, how did Trump get his money? Well, did he steal it? You know, <laughs> did, he, did he defraud people of it? You know, there's some there's a real suspicion of of uh, and I, and that's why I think you know some. You know, some people think Dickens is a conservative, but I mean, he's he's just, his heart is within work with working people in his novels, and he he associates himself as a hard worker, and you know, Joe is a hard worker too. So, yeah. so being a gentleman is almost has a taint of crime associated with it. Can we go back to the sentence um, at the end of the chapter? What was the nameless shadow which again in that one instant had passed? Um, I think that's I think that's uh, 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 he's he sees he sees Molly and doesn't he see something in Molly like maybe Estella? Like remember remember uh, Oliver Twist has a memory of his mother. Oh, thank you, Ava. Sarah. Oh, you're muted, Sarah. I thought a lot about this sentence and uh, because it's right after the jail uh, section, mm -hmm. but it's also right after him saying that he saw her face, she's arriving. The, the sentence that a, a previous one is I saw her face and she was waving to me. And then, the, the, then he has the shadows. So it might be like he, he keeps imagining her 
and the, the way he imagines her is so different than reality. Like he imagines how they'll be happy, but he keeps saying, but I was never happy when I was with her. So, so it's also maybe when he sees us, he realizes it and those are the shadows. It might be multiple, more than one explanation, yeah. Mm -hmm. He does say, I felt contaminated, contaminated experience at, at the prison. And then at that moment, the conjunction with Estella's face and then so that and that question with the italicized verb. <laughs> what was the nameless shadow? So you know what is he aware of at this moment? And what is he not aware of at hmm. this moment? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well the previous paragraph he's talking about how being tainted with uh criminality and then he recalls the times that he on two occasions that he has been um brushed up with criminality and then right in that paragraph he the next thing he talks about is Estella again so we've got the the we're being forced to think about this again where does she come from who is she Pat? uh yes thank you um well if i remember a couple of sessions ago john asked what does it mean to become an adult and you know it seems like right now pip is on the verge of adulthood but he's got this financial wish, which is only to be gained by being gifted the financial ability to do whatever, minus the part where he could be penniless. Uh, and so maybe this is a crossroad here uh, where he's thinking, well, if I'm penniless, it's possible I'll wind up in that prison. Okay. Now, I don't know where the Estella thing comes in. So at any rate, you know, I choose such an odd character. But I, I'm thinking maybe this, because have we, it, have we not gotten yet to the part where he's having trouble managing the funds that he's being given? That's the, that's the next chapter. Okay. Yeah. So that's, it's forward. But it seems like maybe it's the it's the now or never maturity time of his life. Yes, it, it definitely at the we're at a, we're at the crux. We're at a, a liminal portal here, Catherine. Yeah, it it seems like that shadow is is pretty vague, and it it just conveys this like sense of uneasiness that Pip is having. That could be from his experience at the prison, but also could be from Estella herself. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe seeing her is the shadow, like that's coming over him. And I just noticed this one thing when he sees her, he says, I saw her face at the coach window and her hand waving to me. Like he kind of separates her. It's not like Estella was at the window and Estella was waving to me. It was like, you know, she's kind of broken up into pieces, which I just thought was weird. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to make of it, but. No, that's good. Bill? Uh, yeah, it's just in thinking about that, he spends the preceding paragraph talking about how tainted he felt leaving the prison, um, which uh, I think David made the comment earlier that that sort of foreshadowing that, you know, he isn't actually going to grow up and be a gentleman. He's going to grow up and, you know, I hate to give away the ending, but you know, his uh, fortune is all based on crime, um, and that was sort of my take. That you know, he he spent all that time sort of cleansing himself of the the taint of Newgate, and it's like, why did I feel tainted by that? And it's like we all know the answer, or we will know the answer in another hundred pages, um, but it's still for him to find out. Sarah. You're muted, Sarah. 
uh, he has a shadow, but it, it says that it passes in a moment. So he, he has this momentary understanding that the entire thing with Estella is not that uh, idealistic. So he has these uh, realizations, but they pass in a moment. Is, you know, but it does, it does tell us that something, he understands something, even, even though it's only a moment. Yes, Margaret? Thanks. I, like all of you, I, I suppose we're reading it backwards and forwards, and that's how I've, I've been reading it, you know, over and over again. But that uh, little passage of the hand at the window uh, yeah. reminds me that of, uh, of Pip's meeting with the servant of Mr. Jaggers when he went to his home for uh, the dinner. And the, the servant and uh, Mr. Jaggers shows in particular the wrist of the woman. I think her name is Molly. And uh, this is the wrist this, uh, you know, th that murdered somebody. <laughs> And that that is what leaps out at me in that that little paragraph at the end of the chapter here. And that is the intuitive feeling that Pip is sensing something, the connection between the servant woman in Mr. Jagger's home and Estella. And it's it's a it's a it's a remarkable and amazing thing about intuition in the character, too as well as his being so uh, in search of uh, reality, in fact, through theater too, which is after all, a search for reality for all of us, whether we've been in theater or, or appreciate sitting in the audience, that it is a search for reality. And that's what uh, that little paragraph, somehow it, it leapt out at me, I think at the first reading many, many years ago, that that was uh, the precursor of, uh, his his intuitive in, intuitive knowing that the servant of Mr. Jaggers is directly connected to Estella. That's great. So, well, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Ron? Yes, I, I would add just two things to these very good observations that have been made. One, one very good observation is the separation of the face and the hand, um, as if Estella were two different body parts, not, not an integrated person. But the face and the hand are both links back to an earlier scene where face and hand are presented separately in, in the narrative. Um, the other thing that I, I would say about this entire chapter is uh, that, uh, first of all, that, that, that question that Pip asks himself, what was that, that shadow, uh, is, is Dickens, of course, doing something to us as readers. That's a question that he wants us to ask about the novel. So. Uh, that's a question that we should ponder, even you know, in those of us who know what happens and subsequently have an answer to that. But uh, if we're reading this for the first time and coming across it, we may not know. Uh, and so we are meant to speculate about that and to wonder about it. Another thing about this entire chapter is that what is Pip doing? He's killing time. He's waiting for Estella to arrive. And I think that all of the chapters in this section can be understood as or, or thought of as killing time. That is that the narrative is killing time. It's passing time waiting for something to happen. And it's waiting, it's waiting in, in one sense, Pip is waiting to reach the age of maturity because when he's 21, he comes into his fortune, he comes into his expectations, he comes into the possibility that he will find out who the benefactor is. I mean, and, and the novel is preparing us to, for this 
this moment of revelation and clarification. And so it's, it's stalling, it's killing time. Pip is killing time. The narrative is killing time. We, like Pip, are waiting for a moment of revelation and clarification when everything and all of our expectations as readers will be fulfilled. Um, and uh, what, what is that moment? Well, we're, we're waiting for it. We're, uh, uh, Clark called this a liminal moment. It's a threshold moment in the novel uh, where we're just on the cusp of some realization. Um, so the, the, the novel is doing what Pip is doing. It's, it's waiting, it's killing, it's killing time. And then that question, what was that shadow? Um, and we're meant to uh, reflect on the, the word shadow, I think, and, and to think back to earlier shadows and to hold on to the word shadow for any future use of it that may come up. Um, so as you read, as you continue to read, as we continue to read, think about shadow just as a, as a word and watch it, you know, circle the word shadow whenever you encounter it in, in future passages uh, in, in the novel. Uh, so. Is it fair to link ghost with shadows? I, I think we could do that, yes. Yes, sh shades and shadows. Shades and shadows are the same yeah. thing. What is a shade? A shade is a, a ghost. Shadow. Yes. Well, we could move on. Yes, let's move on. We have lots <laughs> of other delicious things to talk about. <laughs> but the, you know, of course, the question is where, because there's so many things to deal with. Uh, I mean, what you just said, John, we get the chapter where Pip comes of age and it's just not satisfying. <laughs> we're, we're left to wait for more. Uh, um, but I, I think we probably ought to talk about the death of Mrs. Joe Gargery um, and how that gets treated here, uh, because in part it is a little comic. Uh, Trab and company are uh, <laughs> dealers in lugubriosity as no one else can. Um, I really still can't picture how that coffin is carried by the six pallbearers with the pall over them. I, <laughs> but he has pulled out all the stops. But uh, other parts of that chapter are less comic. And so I think we ought to talk about what this funeral in the midst of waiting offers us here. Um, thoughts about how this event affects Pitt? Yes, Sarah, uh, you're on, you're muted. Um, is this event, how does this event affect him? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think in many ways, but um, I think the, the, the main thing for me was his discussion with Biddy hmm. uh, and um, he being upset by what she said and why he got upset and everything. Um, but uh, he, he describes he describes very well because uh, uh, in, the, in the context of Estella and Miss Avisham, we talk a lot about tenderness and sunshine. And I think he introduces those terms here. So he, he describes that he didn't have a lot of uh, uh, tenderness towards his sister but in the context of her dying in the funeral, uh, he can have them. He describes it very, very well. And regarding sunshine that shows up so much, so well with uh, Estella's conflict with uh, Miss Avisham, a at the end when he leaves, he talks about Joe, like Joe goes back to his uh, job, to working, and he looks young and energetic and like, like a sunshine is on him. So he describes sunshine in positive, yeah. There is a lot in this chapter, I think. <laughs> Cynthia. 
I like the ambiguity of Joe's, um, no, Biddy's reporting of Mrs. Joe's last words because she says, Joe, pardon Pip with spaces. Now, there are so many possible meanings there that, again, it leaves us wondering, what is she talking about? Um, does she want pardon for herself from Joe and Pip? Does she want Joe to pardon Pip? Uh, so I'm just wondering what other people felt about that. That's a fascinating sentence. Sarah? Okay, uh, I, I, I was going to lower my hand from previous, but I, I'm happy to say what I felt. We know that she's very, very honest because she, she gives a, a peep right answers. And when he says, I'll come visit often, she stays quiet. So she's very, very honest. So I believe that those three words, she's telling the truth. And it's important for her to tell it to peep because a uh, peep was abused by her, mm. but she kind of introduces some tenderness to his memories uh, by telling him that at the end she mentioned him and wants to know about him. Yeah. Yeah. How much? What? What? What is? Which direction is she pointing those? Those three nouns. Um, that's the question. Peter. Uh, yeah, I, I just presume that um, um, she's been pretty. She's uh, she's been miserable to um, Mrs. Joe has been miserable to uh, Pip and to Joe, and she's asking for forgiveness. And uh, forgiveness is something that you know. Uh, I think Joe is Joe actually is probably he seems always to me to be in denial of the fact that she's. Know, that she's actually as miserable as miserable to him as she is. He's constantly like forgiving. He's constantly forgiving her. So finally, she's sort of like relented and asked for forgiveness for, for you know herself. I don't know. It's, it seems to me that that she's asking for forgiveness for what she's done. But uh, you know the 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 idea of forgiveness is there in that in the um, in. Uh, I guess Joe. Joe is a very forgiving person. He's willing to forgive her, and he's also willing to forgive Pip for whatever Pip does to him. Mm -hmm. So you know, just that's that sense of lot at the last moment, she's she's just hearing that. Nothing became. I'm, I'm going in circles. So let's, can we go back to the opening sentence of the chapter also? Um, uh, in which Pip says, uh, it was the first time that a grave had opened in my road of life and the gap it made in the smooth ground was wonderful. It was the first time that a grave had opened in my road of life. That he recalls, <laughs> because in fact, we we opened in a graveyard. Uh, Peter, it, 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 okay. did you have a response no, to that? No, well, it, um, it's, I was going to say it's a wonderful in the sense of like, it's not like, you know, great. It's wonderful in the sense of like, it inspires wonder because he'd not given much thought to death or something. Death mm -hmm. is like not. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. Death is death is a sobering experience that that wow, you know, people do actually die, and that that might change one's attitude towards how one behaves towards people, and that that maybe maybe this whole thing, idea of forgiveness is is part of that, you know, that somehow or another, you know, um, you know, whatever whatever people little things people do do to you pales in comparison to like their whole their whole lives you know you're not going to hold a grudge because after all you know we're only on the earth for a short time <laughs> but anyway death is a one death is a wonderful thing is a it's not a great thing 
it's just a sobering uh, ethical experience or something like that. And he opens this chapter with that idea. Glenna. Yeah, I was thinking about, as we were thinking about this chapter, it seems to me Pip has constructed almost a carapace over himself to deal with his anxieties. He's got these expectations. He's ashamed of his background. He's ashamed of being ashamed of his background. And he just, he just freezes out all kinds of emotions that would interfere with his trying to pursue being a gentleman and, and living up to his great expectations. And as the grave opens up a gap in the road, I think the death opens up a bit of a gap in that carapace he's constructed mm. around himself and some of the feelings that he'd been, you know, carefully keeping out come rushing in, not necessarily for long, but they rush in. And the whole interchange with Biddy is because, you know, on the one hand, he wants to believe in himself as a good person. On the other hand, he he wants to continue to pursue being a gentleman. And those two things are in conflict. Mm, that's good. Cynthia. I wanted to mention that the second sentence the figure of my sister in her chair by the kitchen fire haunted me mm. night and day. We have another ghost. Nice. <laughs> nice. Very good. Excellent. You can't get away from them in this section. <laughs> They're everywhere. Um, and it, I think it's interesting that it opens and closes with what you just, what you all just pointed out and, in between, he is wrestling with trying to put himself into some kind of continuum of human experience. And at the bottom of page 278, uh, he's walking along and remembering how my sister did not spare me. Uh, and then they return with a gentle tone upon them that softened even the edge of Tickler. For now, the very breath of the beans and clover whispered to my heart that the day must come when it would be well for my memory that that others walking in the sunshine should be softened as they thought of me. John? I was going to comment on, on something. Oh, go ahead. Slight, slightly different. Which go is, ahead. Um, and, and, and I think you've already made reference to this, that this is not the first time that a grave has opened up in his life. That the the novel begins with graves and not just the graves of his dead parents and his dead siblings, um, but with a grave that opens up because the convict in that opening scene springs up from the earth as if from a grave. So th there's an open grave at the, at the very beginning of the book that Pip can't recognize and can't remember. So even as he tells the story, Pip the narrator, remembering back to his past, conveniently forgets another grave or many graves that have opened up in his life. So it raises questions about, about Pip's memory, what he remembers and what he doesn't remember. It's just a startling sentence to open the Open the chapter and kind of knocks me back a bit. And then, as as was pointed out, um, he remembers his sister, and like a ghost. Right, right. Does the humor undermine this, or is this a is that a necessary comic treatment? Well, I think it gets us, it helps to enhance this conversation that he has with Biddy because uh, mm. he has gone off to be a gentleman and thinks of himself as a better person than they are. And we have this comical scene and then 
Biddy is very clearly pointing out to him what he's that he's being an ass. He is not responding. He is not caring. He does does not send letters. He is not, you know, he's and she does it in that a beautiful way of, you know, saying, Oh, you will? You say you will, okay. <laughs> Oh, that's great. She holds him, holds his feet to the fire. Yes. David. There's an essay of Dickens. I can't remember where it is, but uh, he's talking about Victorian funeral customs, which he finds ludicrous and revolting. That's in the background here. It is revolting. <laughs> no better word for it. Um, Catherine. Yeah, just following up on what David just said, you know, Joe says that part where he didn't he didn't want to have the funeral that way. You know, he said, I would in preference have carried her to the church myself along with three or four friendly ones what come to it with willing hearts and arms. But it were considered what the neighbors would look down on such and would be of opinions as it were wanted in respect. So Joe wants it to be, you know, he just wants it to be like people who love her and people who are friends with him and not all formal. He doesn't like that formality that's kind of being inflicted on him. Except that like in all in all other certain circumstances, he feels obliged somehow or another to do it because it's what other people say is respectable in the same same way that he he reacts to to uh, to Pip when he goes to London. It's like he's trying to be respect. Res he trying he wants people to respect him or something. You know, it's like so mm -hmm. so it's like he's he's kind of kind of confused by the situation. I think it's like he doesn't he, he you know and anyway Dickens Dickens tends to see it as a um, funeral as a there's a lot of buffoonery going on, a lot of sort of like a lot of denial of death, you know, a lot of sort of like fakery going on in, in the, the funeral ceremony. And uh, Joe doesn't want to have anything to do with that. But on the other hand, if other people say it's respectable, he's going to do it, you know. Well, in, in the Victorian age, they hired mourners, professional people to come and look sad at the funeral speaking of ingenuine feelings and i think you're 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 right that that uh clark in, in, in and barb uh, about the mixture of comedy and seriousness in in this passage dickens thought that funerals were funny because they were a form of theater that people mm -hmm. were performing mm -hmm. certain roles and you hired a, a director a funeral director we still have the the term a funeral director who directs people on how to behave he hands out handkerchiefs you know because mourners are supposed to perform publicly the act of their their grief so there's something theatrical and hypocritical about about funerals that Dickens is delights in making fun of, but it's also at the same time serious. And one of the things that is funny and sort of horrible in this funeral is the role of Pumblechook. And Pumblechook. Pumblechook is a really interesting character in this novel, and we haven't talked enough about him, I, I think. But Pumblechook, Pumblechook's role in the funeral is to keep congratulating himself on being responsible for Pip's expectations. Uh, and so whenever Pumblechook appears, he wants to shake hands with Pip, and he's not shaking hands with Pip to congratulate Pip. He's congratulating Pip so that Pip can thank him for being responsible for uh, everything good that happens in Pip's life. So Pumblechook is performing the role of benefactor, 
whenever he appears, because that's including including mentioning that that Joe's uh, that uh, Mrs. Joe would have appreciated <laughs> what what uh, his his role in in uh, in in, uh, in helping Pip anyway. Yes. And there, there's a there's a passage, a, a couple of paragraphs I I would like to to read, um, and I'm in a different edition of the novel, but they're in this chapter, uh, and it's a paragraph that begins, Clark, maybe you can help me find it. And now the range of marshes lay clear before us, um, and it's uh, um, it's on two eighty one. 281. Okay. So I, I, if, if you're, that's in the Penguin edition. And I'll, I'll now read that paragraph and the paragraph below it. And now the range of marshes lay clear before us with the sails of the ships on the river growing out of it. And we went into the church, churchyard close to the graves of my unknown parents, Philip Pirrup, late of this parish and also Georgiana, wife of the above. And there my sister was laid quietly in the earth while the larks sang high above it and the light wind strewed it with beautiful shadows of clouds and trees. But let me stop there and comment. Here are the other graves that, mm -hmm. that lay before Pip that he's not thinking of at the beginning of, of this chapter. And here also is a mention of that word larks that is the word that, that links Pip and Joe together. Remember what larks? Um, and here also is that word shadow, the beautiful shadows of the clouds and trees. So if you start looking for the word shadow and shadows and shades even, you'll find it very often. So let me go on and read the next paragraph, because here's where it turns from melancholy remembrance of other deaths into the comedy of Pumblechook, of the conduct of the worldly-minded Pumblechook, which this was, while this was doing, I desire to say no more than it, than it was all addressed to me. And that even when those noble passages were read, which remind humanity how it brought nothing into the world and can take nothing out and how it fleeth like a shadow and never continueth long in one stay. I heard him cough a reservation of the case of a young gentleman who came unexpectedly into large property. When we got back, he in the hardihood to, he had the hardihood to tell me that he wished my sister could have known I had done her so much honor and to him that she would have considered it reasonably purchased at the price of her death. And it goes on. Um, Pumblechook again, taking credit, but there's something, there's a quote hidden in, in that passage. This is, this is a, a quote from the book of Job about uh, the, the fact that we come into life, we are born into life with nothing and we leave life with nothing. And the passage is biblical, how it, that is life, fleeth like a shadow and never continueth long in one stay. So Pip is remembering here the, the words from the book of Job from, from the Old Testament about the fleetingness of life. And so there's something very serious and biblical, a different, a different voice, a different tone, at the same time that Pumblechook is there performing his Pumblechook role. So um, the mixture, like the Hamlet chapter, mm. of comedy and seriousness, of life and death and eternal questions about human existence is present uh, as we, uh, read this chapter. That's great, John. Thank you. Margaret? Thank you. That was that was heavy. <laughs> that those all those comments by John Jordan. But uh my, my I have two questions. One is um did Dickens himself have the job 
of uh, a mourning boy at funerals, or was it one of his characters who was employed as a mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, boy at funerals? And my second question is regard to this chapter in which one of the paid mourners who met Pip at the door with the staff wrapped in black, um, he lost his job at a hotel because he had turned a, a man and a woman into sawdust by some what something that he did at the hotel. And I, I have a question, what is that? <laughs> what, what did he do to turn the couple into sawdust in their bed? So those are two, two questions, if you don't mind. Thank you. If I could, I, I'll answer quickly because I think I know the answers. Uh, Pip, uh, Dickens did, did not himself in his childhood perform the act of a child mourner uh, during a funeral, but Oliver Twist in the novel that has that name does perform that role in, a, in a, another comic horrific uh, uh, description of a funeral. So it's it's a motif that Dickens is, is familiar with, not from his own life experience, but as an observer. And what that post boy has done is that he drove a carriage and he made a sudden turn and uh, threw two of the people who were in his coach into a pile of sawdust. So he turned the carriage or the coach he was driving suddenly and threw them into the sawdust. So he turned them into sawdust. Ah, Sarah. Cynthia. The humble book, humble took role is to be a false benefactor and to pretend that he's a benefactor. And I just want to see if we can bookmark that notion of a false benefactor and talk about it later this year. Good point. And Pip pats himself on the back a couple of times in this chapter as well, um, thinking about how people might look back on him in the future. In the future, we look back on him as a some you know soothing source of feeling. And then when he asks if he can sleep in his room. Um, I felt that I had done rather a great thing in making the request. Um, I don't know. Does he, does he need to pat himself on the back for making that request? Um, or is he just happy that he did something kind of nice? <laughs> Well, I think he can't avoid being self-conscious of being back where he grew up mm. and, you know, still fancying himself a gentleman when, you know, he's not quite one yet. He's, you know, obviously insecure in that place, but going back, you know, but it's plain that he doesn't belong back where he grew up. So he he has to assuage his, his self with the small things that he can do. Yeah, that makes sense. Pat? Sure. Uh, well, you know, basically he he looks down on Joe. I mean, Joe is the lower class, but he makes himself a better look a better person by now tr doing these kind of behind the scenes kind of underhanded things uh, that are superficially kind, yet on the other hand, uh, what does a good word be a good word for it not kind at all uh, there you know he is acting like uh, Estella here uh, in that you know he's acting in an underhanded kind of way which is a little disappointing you know because I'm, I'm I ho always hope that he'll turn out to be a fairly decent guy <laughs> and this is the time when he needs to do that. Okay, thanks for letting me talk. <laughs> true, true. Oh, totally agree. Margaret? Okay, to, uh, I, I believe with your question about his sleeping in the room that he was patting himself on the back, but I'm very interested 
in the conversation, the short conversation he has with Biddy, yeah. where he's so accusatory of her and accuses her of not communicating with him about his sister's uh, illness or and near demise. And uh, what do you make a make of that conversation where Biddy is where Biddy is does not act out any sort of um, remonstrance toward Pip at all, but she's very, very humble and uh, takes his criticism. And um, anyway, I think it's a very, very interesting insight into Pip's character, the way he is speaking to Biddy and how, as the reader can see, how disillusioned, how, uh, how un unsuspecting he is of his own frailties of his own uh, character frailties. So I'm interested in other people's ideas on that. Thank you. No, that's really important. Uh, what an injustice Biddy had done me. Wow. <laughs> Catherine? So the part that, um, the part where he's asking if he can stay in the room or saying, you know, he'd done a great thing by staying in the room and then going into the part about Biddy, that transition is happens in one paragraph on page 282. Um, and the last sentence of that paragraph says, when the shadows of evening were closing in, I took an opportunity of getting into the garden with Biddy for a little talk. So it's almost like going back to that word shadows, like is he casting a shadow on the whole thing by being arrogant and not very compassionate towards Biddy and thinking he's kind of better than everybody else, or I don't know what other people think about the word shadow there. Great. Now that we're keenly attuned. <laughs> Sarah? You're, you're muted. I don't, I'm not answering Katerin's question yet, but I, uh, uh, I was thinking a lot about uh, the way Biddy answered him. She talks about her human failures that she needs to work on. And when he tells her that he, he's not uh, angry, but he's uh, hurt, he mentions it's one of your, yeah, he insults her. This was one of your human failures. And I wondered why he felt so strongly about it. Mm -hmm. Because he starts a chapter saying that he didn't visit them for a long time, he didn't see them. But I wonder if this chapter, there is a section in one of the chapters when he thinks about expectations and he remembers his life with Joe and he, he asks himself, I actually was happier then. Did this come before, um, before this chapter? I'm not sure, but, but even though he acknowledges that he didn't visit them, he didn't write to them, and Biddy was right in questioning if he's sincere. Uh, maybe his feelings changed. She doesn't know about it. And maybe he, he really wanted to stay in his own room. He really wanted, he felt happy there. Uh, and why, why did he get so upset? Because maybe there is a disconnect between uh, uh, him changing, his feelings changing, and Biddy knowing about it. And the question that I want to ask, remember, then he goes to Joe and he tells Joe the same thing. He said, I'll come and visit often. And Joe replies to him something not too soon, not too often, or something like that. Never too soon. <laughs> never too soon, never too. Never, never too, too soon, never too often. Never too soon, never too often. What did he mean? Did he mean don't buy? If you cannot make it, don't make it. If you cannot make it very soon, don't make it. Or, or did he mean nothing will be soon enough for me? Or how do you read this sentence? Thoughts? Nothing would be too soon for him, for Joe. He wants to see him. Yeah. Say again. Say again. He said. It means nothing would be too soon for him to come as far as Joe is concerned. He wants him to come soon and often. Okay, so that's why, because Joe didn't uh, react to, to his answer. It doesn't sound that he was angry or happy with his answer. So maybe Joe 
gave him the answer that he wanted to hear. It, and she didn't, but he didn't give him the and, answer. And she didn't, yeah, yeah. And yeah. You, you have to remember that his last visit, which was when Miss Havisham asked for him, he didn't stay at Joe's place. I know, yeah, totally. And he felt promised to come back and didn't come back. So Biddy is acting on what she saw happen in the past. Joe is giving him the benefit of the doubt and assuming that if he says he'll come, he will come. But Yeah, so she, when she talks about her human faults, and uh, he, he says, this is one of your human faults, what is the human fault to just be honest and to think exactly what she to say exactly what she thinks and not to put it in a nice way or yes she is honest with him and she's showing him that he is he is not being honest and she he's not happy at having that pointed out to him yeah 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 Virginia? Yeah, I find that whenever Pip comes home, he's really insufferable. Like he's so into his great expectations that he's never thought about his sister. He never inquires or writes. And now suddenly, oh, Biddy, why didn't you tell me what was happening? Well, you know, you don't even seem to care what's going on. And likewise, you know, when he's, oh, I'm so big of me to sleep in my own, grace you with my presence in the house. It's he's just insufferable. And then when he leaves, like whenever he does these things afterwards, he feels bad about how he's been never corrects them while they're going on and he treats Biddy so poorly the whole idea of you know her human frailties what her frailties are the fact that she actually cares about his sister and his brother and Joe and takes care of them whereas Pip does nothing but without where you know his big bucks coming up and how he can get with Estella um and I just you know he really every time he comes home for whatever the reason he's so horrible <laughs> um and he doesn't pick up on it till later like you want him to be better there but he's not Share your frustration. <laughs> and I am frustrated with him. <laughs> Pat? Yeah, you know what? I'm sorry I'm going to take the opposite of opinion of what Joe is saying here. I think Joe is finally getting the picture because uh, there are times, this time and whenever he went to uh, London and had dinner, lunch, whatever meal that was, and then he wouldn't stay. Yeah. I, think that Joe is saying, you know, I I get where you are now. You know, you're an upper crust now and mm -hmm. you really don't want to have anything to do. So I think he's like flipping him off. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> By saying, yeah, come anytime. And he's saying under his breath, yeah, likely you're going to come. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my theory, but that's the way my mind works. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. David? In defense of Pip, he's not yet 21. And at that age, a lot of us were pretty full of ourselves. Thank you, David. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite true. <laughs> um, and, and, but it, it's still a little frustrating, I think, at the end when he does say, um, Biddy was quite right. All I can say is they were quite right, too. Well, yeah, I'm glad you got it now <laughs> um well we're, we're running out of time here as it turns out and i think we're going to have to jettison some of this fantastic stuff so don't we need to talk about chapter estella. yeah we, we gotta we gotta talk about estella and miss havisham and the texas death match that they have in that room um so shall we talk about uh, the final chapter for today? Is that okay? What? Yeah. So this is um, Estella. So this is Estella, right? Yes, this is the uh, chapter thirty-eight, uh, chapter nineteen. If you're using book two, uh, yeah. when um, Pip does kind of stand back and give a give us a. Know, some breadth of vision here on this relationship, um, both at uh, with Mrs. Branley and then at Ms. Havisham's. Um, um, and he continues to say that I never had one hour's happiness in her society, and yet my mind all around the four and twenty hours was harping on the happiness of having met having her uh, with me unto death. Pip. 
What do we do with this guy at this point? <laughs> I believe somebody made the comment that at you know one in twenty, we were not very wise. <laughs> Uh, true. But it's not only Pip. It's obvious that she's having this effect on all the young men around her. They are all infatuated with her and all unable to see the way she's treating them. It's true. Can you repeat the question, Sally? I'm just curious about reactions to this, uh, our, our protagonist here and, and his contradictory comments. Um, and of course, part of the issue is, John, you've raised before, is that Pip is writing this after the fact and separating then and now is always tricky in this kind of narration. Um, what was he aware of then that he, and what was he aware of now that he wasn't then? Um, but he does repeat it so frequently that it uh, it, be it becomes a you know a drumbeat in the novel. So what does he repeat? Sorry. <laughs> that uh, well, this this one sentence, uh, page three hundred one at the top, chapter thirty eight. Um, uh, I had never I never had one hour's happiness in her society, and yet my mind all around the four and twenty hours was harping on the happiness. Of having were having her with me unto death. Yeah, totally, totally. Virginia, wasn't this um, at the same time Dickens was having the affair and his wife was breaking up uh, with him and he was suffering miserably with this relationship and I'm I'm drawing a blank suddenly on the woman's name that he had the affair with, um, but he you know she was very young and he was smitten with her. And he saw love as a misery, you know, love was agony because he could fill this relationship with her. And this is what was going on in his own life at the time. And so I feel like Pip is reflecting his view that, you know, love is a misery as a wife that he doesn't love anymore. And he was trying to get rid of her. And he's got a Stella, like his current, you know, girl that he's interested in, but she wasn't really interested in him um, as much as he was interested in. Her. So I feel like Pip is reflecting Dickens thoughts that you know love is a misery and it's not you know filled with happiness it's it's agony to be in love yes <laughs> Rick did you raise your hand I have a I have a thought about I, you know, Pip strikes me as like being terribly masochistic. You know, <laughs> well, I would never, I've never hang around with a with a woman who didn't give a shit about me. You know, I, I wouldn't do it. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, his really perverse. You know, like uh, he'll say things like uh, that. He doesn't. On the next page, I, I should have replied that love was commonly reputed blind. There's a, there's a paragraph there. And my comment in the margin was, this is perverse. Yeah, he's giving her, he's refusing to, like, uh, he's refusing to, to criticize her because she's under the influence of Miss Havisham, after all. And that she has to behave that way because that's the way she is. So he's kind of like forgiving her for mistreating him, you know. And uh, you know that. But the truth is, uh, and, or he's giving her the benefit of the doubt, you know. And, and uh, struck me as it just struck me as as kind of perverse, you know, that um, because actually she's she's a thorough sociopath. She has no feelings whatsoever for anybody. She's she, but he's saying, well, maybe she has feelings for me hidden under there. Or maybe maybe if Miss Havisham hadn't like distorted her so much, she would have good feelings for me. And it's so, like she's, he's, he's making excuses for her or something. And this, but it's peculiar. It's a peculiar sort of analysis of like a, a very complicated, twisted psychological state, you know. And this does precede the big conversation that the following totally. 
totally. Rick? Yeah, the, um, Estelle has apparently been instructed to tease all kinds of men and get them all lusting after her and seeming to pay attention to some of them even, including this one character in particular. And the purpose of it is somehow to affect the, somehow to affect Pip for some reason like that would make him a better person if he has to put up with all of this. She's nice to everybody but him. Uh, is that just part of her uh, part of Haversham's sadism, or is there some point to all of that? Do you follow me? I, I think I think we're right back in the middle of a revenge tragedy at this point. Um, the best I can tell. Other people want to chime. This is in? the last chapter that we're supposed to be reading today that I'm talking about. I think. Right. Yes. And, and um and and pip is mystified i mean why are they doing this that he has to go through all of this and somehow he's supposed to end up with estelle makes no sense <laughs> that i guess i made my point sarah okay so so all along he has the idea that uh, Estella's role that uh, Miss Avish, Avisham uh, gave her is to make men miserable. And when this revenge, and when her, this role will end, she'll marry him and all everything will be okay. So he, he kind of has this fancy story that he tells himself. And I think the breakthrough and the very complicated chapter is a, the chapter that we talk about and the discussion between Estella and her mother is just so deep how Estella, it's amazing. Like even when she talks about, uh, you taught me darkness, but you didn't teach me sunshine. And she has two versions of the same story. One is you only taught me darkness and only for purpose you introduced me to sunshine when I was older. And the second version, she said, here is a more accurate version. You introduced me to darkness and you introduced me to sunshine uh, when it, it had a purpose still in childhood. So, so and she explains, you, you, cannot, you cannot program a person from childhood uh, like Miss Avisham programmed her. And, uh, 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 and she, she, cannot, she, she has the effect of the childhood and it doesn't go exactly the way Miss Avisham and she gets to the point that she cannot really love Miss Avisham because Miss Avisham really didn't raise her to love anybody. And maybe he can start thinking understanding reality and understand that maybe she won't be able to love him as well. And I think um, the story with Drummel, when he, he finds out that Drummel is, is a, she's interested in Drummel and they have the conversation, is it in the same chapter? Yes. I, I think, think this is very meaningful to the story. I think we need two hours just for this section. Two hours on this chat. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Karen. Yeah, I would just like, this is probably a more rhetorical question, but I think we all should reflect on what role models Pip has ever had for love, for healthy love. Uh, and I think he really has no one, and yet we expect him to navigate the complexities of both Estelle's and Miss Havisham's manipulations around love with him. Uh, no one has ever modeled what I think healthy love is for him. And I think we have to cut him a break where that's concerned. <laughs> we have to say that Joe did model it for him, healthy love. Now, healthy love? Joe, Joe, no, yeah. But, well, healthy love for him, but I don't think he was able to understand that he sees Joe's love in the context of his sister um and so it gets muddled yeah 
I mean, he comes close, but I yeah, still... but he is learning. Him, him sitting there and listening uh, to, he's learning while, and then he decides to leave. This is another question. Why does he, does he decide to leave? It's, it's so complicated, but I think yeah. he's learning as he goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you could argue that Joe's suffering under the lashes of Mrs. Joe's tongue is not dissimilar to what Pip is going through with Estella, right? He's, if Joe is his role model, Joe has always been sort of abused by his wife. And so Estella not treating him well might, from his standpoint, be perfectly normal. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. It's a very scary chapter, uh, even with, uh, you know, Halloween trappings of the description of uh, Miss Habisham on pages 302 and 303. Um, I mean, she's, she is witch-like, she is weird, most weird, uh, very specter. Um, and then I get the, we get the paragraph on page 303, pale gloom, withered, ghostly, Awful figure, cobwebs, crawling, spiders, mice, gropings, beetles. I've read Macbeth. Uh, that's <laughs> thank you, Charles Dickens. Um, David, I want at least to mention the final paragraph of the chapter. Dickens often deepens a story by using fairy tale references or overtones. And I think this one really sinks in and it's just, you're waiting for that rock to fall. Oh it's, yeah. It's terribly effective. Yeah. You wanna say more about that, David? Uh, well, the only thing more I could say, and I don't, I don't know how we're doing on time, would be to read it aloud. Uh, we have five minutes. But also, can anyone give us a background there? I don't know this story that they're referring to. Does anyone know what mythical story or they're mm, referring to? There's a footnote in the penguin on it. It isn't in my version. That's why I'm asking. Uh, I thought I haven't got notes, unfortunately. I can not the Arabian Nights. It's some. It's another book that's. Uh huh. And, and people. What's the it. name of the story so I can look it up? It's a. As a small boy, Dickens had a book by Sir Charles Morell called Tales of the Genie. This is a series of interwoven tales in the manner of the Arabian Nights. The sixth tale of which Dickens was particularly fond, for he is known to have dramatized it as a child, is called The Enchanters, or Misnar, the Sultan of India. Misnar's wise vizier, Horam, fills his enemies, foils his enemies by building the elaborate trap referred to here. Thank you. Now, I read so many fairy tales, etc., when I was younger, but this is one I'm unfamiliar with, so I shall look it up. <laughs> it's just so... Fascinating to think about Dickens performing this as as a child. Like this is this is what he wanted to spend his time doing—a <laughs> theatrical production, <laughs> uh, a fantastical story. Um, well, uh, John, we are here at the end of our two-hour session. Okay. We are indeed. Do you have any concluding words, Clark? You'd like to leave us with no I'm, I'm i i one of the things that struck me in reading these chapters was was the emphasis on ghosts and and thanks to you for emphasizing the shadows in this um in this section it, it really is it's a, it's a dark sequence uh with those hysterically funny set pieces um and i think that's part of what the 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 beauty of the book for me is that I am constantly pulled back and forth between delight, laughter, and mid mystery. You know, what am I to make of all of this? How am I to figure out this personality? So I am, uh, I'm riveted at this point and looking forward to more. 
Well, that killing time is what I think uh, a, a motif for for these chapters. That these these are all leading up to some great event, some revelation, some slab that is going to fall upon our protagonist. Um, a fairy tale ending, or a surprise ending, or a, a twist, a turn. Something is about to happen. So Dickens wants his readers to keep reading, and uh, so we will. Thank you, everyone, for contributing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Clark. Thank you. See you next month. <laughs>